Hello everyone, uh, my name is Will Daniels. Welcome to my virtual grad symposium talk. We are going to be discussing atmospheric carbon monoxide models. Uh, so I've been working on this project with my advisor, Dor Amerling, and also our collaborator up at NCAR, uh, Rebecca Butchold. And also Dorit and I are kind of co-advising an undergraduate student who is working on really similar material. So I'm gonna give her a little shout out later on in this presentation as well. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. So the kind of one sentence summary of what we've been doing is that we are using natural variability in the climate to model atmospheric carbon monoxide. So that's kind of the gist of it. Um, before we get into more of the details, I wanna motivate the study a little bit. So you could ask, you know, why model carbon monoxide in the first place? Um, and there's lots of reasons actually, but I'm gonna talk about fires. So in the Southern hemisphere, fires are actually the primary source of carbon monoxide emissions. So as a result of that, we can kind of use carbon monoxide as a proxy for fires. Um, and so when we make these predictive carbon monoxide models, we can actually help countries, or potentially help countries prepare for really large burn events. So one example of these burn events is the 2015 fires in Indonesia. These were really, really large. And another is the recent Australia fires. So during these Australia fires, um, pharmacies and hardware stores actually ended up running out of face masks really rapidly once the air started to look like this photo on the left here. Um, and so obviously there's some pretty uh, blatant parallels between this Australia situation and the current COVID-19 crisis. Um, and I think in both, there's a lot of value in having some sort of predictive tool that will tell us when these crises are gonna happen. And so that's kind of where these predictive carbon monoxide models come in, because if they say, um, you know, hey, we have a really big fire season coming up, countries like Australia can stock up on face masks or get more volunteers ready to fight these bushfires. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into some of the details of what we're doing here. So we're doing a regression model. So we have predictor variables and we have response variables and there's data sets for each. So we're gonna start with our response variable, which is carbon monoxide. So we get the carbon monoxide data from the MOPIT instrument, which is on a NASA satellite. And we aggregate that data into seven different biomass burning regions. Uh, and then in each of those regions, we create a separate model. So that plot here is just showing those seven regions. They're all in the Southern hemisphere and they're all kind of centered on big um, burn areas or areas that are typically have a lot of burn events. So the actual variable we use as a response is the deseasonalized carbon monoxide anomaly at a given time, T. And so we, what we mean by deseasonalized is kind of shown in this, this plot here. So the gray dots are the measurements of carbon monoxide from MOPIT and those are monthly averaged. And then what we can do is average all of the Januaries, all of the Februaries, et cetera, and plot that, and that's that black line. And that's what we call the seasonal trend. And so if we subtract that seasonal trend away from the data, we get the anomaly. And that's what is plotted in the bottom there. Okay, so moving on now to our predictor variables. Earlier I said that we want to use variability in the climate as our predictor variables. And the reason is, is that the climate is actually really closely tied to these larger burn events. And the connection there is that, say for instance, you have a particularly dry season, then your vegetation is gonna get dried out and it's gonna be more likely to burn. So fortunately for us, there are metrics that exist that kind of summarize that aperiodic change in the climate. And those are called climate indices. And so this plot to the left here is showing four climate indices that we're using in our study. Uh, the first one, for example, the Nino 3.4 climate index summarizes the El Nino-La Nina oscillation, which you might have heard of. It affects things like snowpack if you're a skier, but it's, it's basically just um, a slight fluctuation in temperature in the Pacific Ocean. And so these climate indices are predictive variables, but we lag them at a time t minus tau. And we do that because we're interested in prediction, right? So if we have climate index data right now, we want to know what the carbon monoxide is going to look at at a later time, T plus tau. Okay, so now we can get into the model itself. Um, we're using a multiple linear regression model and we include first order interaction terms. So in that green box, that's the, what we call the main effect. Um, those chi variables are the climate indices that we just talked about. Uh, there's a little sub K there because there's four different indices that we can include in our model. 
And like I said, they're, they're um, lagged at a value of t minus tau. And that tau has a sub k as well because each climate index can have its own lag value. And then the interaction term on the right there, um, that is just two climate indices multiplied together. And that captures the effects that, um, that when multiple or one, two of these climate indices both go positive at the same time, it actually has a really, really large effect. And so that kind of compounding effect is captured in that interaction term. So at this point, you might be asking, you know, how do we perform our variable selection? And that just means, how do we decide which climate indices to put in our model out of the four? And then how do we pick those lag values, those tau k's? So for variable selection, we have created an R package. It's called reg climate chem for abbreviation for climate chemistry. And it's kind of just a wrapper for three different um, variable selection algorithms. And if there's a stepwise selection, a genetic or stochastic search algorithm, and a best subset selection. And so I don't have quite enough time to go into detail on all of those, but the general gist is that as you move from the bottom to the top in that list, you get better model accuracy, but you have longer run times. And so we have three options there just to um, give researchers with different amounts of computational resources three different options that they can use to do this kind of analysis. Okay, so how do we do, how do we pick the lag values? So instead of doing our uh, variable selection on the entire parameter space, we actually break it up by lag set. So in this image, the, the orange boxes are lag set. And a lag set is just one combination of lag values for each index. So there's four indices there, uh, and they each can take a lag value. In this study, it's from one to eight months. Okay. Uh, and when you iterate through all the different combinations of possible lag sets, you get something that we call the lag space matrix. And that's that blue box there. So to do our variable selection, we iteratively go through uh, one lag set at a time. So say we start with lag set number one. There's the four indices that each are lagged at a value of one month. We then use one of those three variable selection algorithms I just talked about, and we come up with some model. And it's going to have some information criteria. Maybe it's adjusted or squared, or maybe it's AIC or BIC. Um, these are just numbers that kind of quantify how good a model is. And again, I don't really have too much time to go into detail on those. But we use BIC just because it is kind of geared toward prediction. So we go through and we do this for every single lag set. We end up getting a list of BIC values. And then we can kind of just pick the best one. And that's what we use. That model is what we use as our um, predictive model in the region. And then the lag values come along with that. So that's how we pick lag values. Now we can do a little bit of model validation to see how well these models um, actually work. And so if we consider the Maritime Southeast Asia region, we can train our model on the 2001 to 2014 data and then test it on the 2015 to 2016 data. And the results of this study are kind of shown in this plot here. So the black dots are the measured values from MOPIT. The blue triangles are our predictions for the training set, and the orange triangles are our predictions in the test set. And we see that the model actually performs pretty well, especially in this 2015 year. Um, it's able to capture this really large spike in carbon monoxide pretty well, which is really promising because that's what um, that's one thing we're really interested in is capturing those large peaks. So to conclude here, uh, I just want to reiterate that. The big one sentence summary is that we are using variability in the climate, so those climate indices, to model atmospheric carbon monoxide. Um, and so in the bottom left there, that table is just uh, summary statistics for each model in each of the response regions. Uh, we can see a lot of those models do pretty well, um, but some have some room for improvement. And so going forward, we're interested in improving those models, and we have a couple ideas of where to go with that. Um, we also want to apply these models to the recent Australia fires, uh, see how they do, and then maybe set up some sort of advanced warning system that could be used in the future um, to give a little heads up when one of those big fire events is going to happen. We also want to investigate the scalability of these variable selection algorithms, um, and so that's probably going to be scaling up our parameter space and moving to an HPC system like Cheyenne at NCAR. Um, and then finally, we are interested in optimizing some of those algorithms as well. So, for instance, the, the undergrad student, Mira Dougal, she is really looking into this optimization study and she's giving a MRF talk later this month. So if you're interested in learning more about that, go ahead and check it out. And with that, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up. So thanks for listening. If you have any questions, my email is listed there. 
feel free to uh, reach out. Thanks very much.